thank you everybody for joining us today for our second 2021 NED talk. Um, you know, this is a, a presentation followed by a questions and answers webcasts. We hope everybody will be able to stay on all the time. My name is Rafael de Ameyer, and I will facilitate today's interactive broadcast. Um, everybody is going to be in listen only mode. And uh, the way we handle the questions is there is a question and answer box just underneath there. There's a window that's Q&A. You can add your questions there at any time during the presentation or at the end of the presentation. We also have a, uh, the option of showing captions. In the bottom left corner, there's a web links box and in there there's a captions link do not hesitate to click on that captions link it will open up a new window that you can use for uh, captions and um, just announce to everybody that we're celebrating the launch of two NOAA satel satellites next year a geostationary satellite and a polar satellite and because of that we are dedicating our data fest net talks to these wonderful satellites Last week, we had Gerald Torres uh, present on uh, low Earth orbit, polar orbiting satellites. And today we have the pleasure of having Dan Lindsay to talk to us about geostationary satellites and the data that comes from geostationary satellites. And with that, I'm just gonna hand it right over to him. Dan, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Rafa. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for taking the time to join us today. I hope you uh, find this topic interesting. Um, I will say, looking through the list of attendees, I see that um, some of you, I, I know some of you I don't, which is great. Um, and I, I, I know some of you are meteorologists. So I will say that the, the, um, these slides are largely uh, sort of on the beginner level. I, I, I wanted to introduce uh, geostationary satellites to somebody who not, doesn't necessarily have a meteorology background. However, there are some things where we get into a little bit more detail, so hopefully I can keep everyone uh, interested throughout. Um, I will also say that the things I'm going to share today are contributions from lots of different people at NESDIS, NOAA Cooperative Institutes, and other places. So this is, uh, this is not all my material. I'm just sharing it uh, to, to everybody else today. Uh, next slide, please. So first, a little intro about geostationary satellites. What is a geostationary satellite? Well, what does geostationary mean? What that means is we launch the satellite up to an orbit above the Earth so that it orbits at the same rate that the Earth spins. And you can kind of get an idea of that on this movie, which I know is a little bit choppy over the uh, the shared screen here. Um, but the idea is if you're if you're orbiting at the same rate, you can take pictures very frequently and you're always looking at the same area. And what that allows us to do is animate the feature on the earth that we're actually looking at. Uh, for example, hurricanes, storms, uh, things like that. And I'll show many, many examples of that a little bit later. NOAA has two geostationary satellites in orbit. Um, they're called goes east and goes west. Um, if you could go maybe back and start this one one more time, Sarah, so it'll, it'll loop again. Um, Goes east is centered over the east part of the US and it covers an area from the west coast of Africa, um, all of South America, um, much of really all of the continental US and part of the East Pacific. And then goes west is centered over the Eastern Pacific Ocean and it covers primarily the western part of the continental US, um, Alaska, Hawaii in terms of land areas, as well as much of the, the central and the Eastern Pacific Ocean. So overall, we have a, a view all the way from the coast of Africa out to New Zealand, and it really allows us to keep a constant watch on all of the weather systems that are happening um, within these regions. Next slide. A little bit of history. Um, it turns out we've actually been launching these geostationary operational environmental satellites. We, we do love our acronyms in NOAA. G-O-E-S stands for GOES. That's where that comes from. We've been launching these all the way back from the 1970s. 1975 was when we first had GOES-1. And every few years, we update the technology on the satellites by putting in new instruments, et cetera. Um, back in 2016, we launched what we call the GOES-R series. That's a series of four satellites, um, R, S, T, and U. When those satellites reach geostationary orbit, we give them numbers instead of names. And so, so far we've launched two. Um, goes R and goes S, and those became goes 16 and goes 17. 
Those are the two that I mentioned that are in our east and west position. And on the bottom there, you may notice uh, Ghost T and Ghost U have not been given numbers yet because they haven't been launched yet. They're going to be launched. Ghost T is, is planned for launch in early 2022, and I'll talk more about that at the end. And then Ghost U is planned for launch in 2024. On the right of this graphic, you can also see a mention of GeoXO. That's our future system. And I'm going to say much more about this uh, at the very end of the presentation as well. Next slide. Okay, so some more details on Goes East. The image here is a, a true color or approximate true color image that I'll talk about from Goes East, and it shows you the coverage. And you can see there on the far right, um, the coast of Africa, you can see that we're centered very well over South America. In fact, geostationary satellites are over the equator at about 22,000 miles up. And that's, that's really, really high. Um, uh, the, uh, for comparison, the space station, I believe, is on the order of about, uh, 250 or 500 miles, something like that. So we're, we're talking um, orders of magnitude higher above the Earth for these geostationary satellites. And again, that is in order to obtain the same orbit or the same rate that the Earth spins. Uh, GOES-16 was launched back in 2016. It's been the operational GOES East since uh, December of 2017. You can see the coverage very well here. The primary Earth pointing instruments are known as the Advanced Baseline Imager, or you'll hear me say ABI as well as the Geostationary Lightning Mapper, or GLM. GLM uh, provides us the first time the ability to see lightning activity, total cloud lightning activity, not just cloud to ground, um, looking at it constantly. So there's no gaps in coverage. Um, if, if there's a lightning flash with a storm, then we should be able to see it with GLM. Next slide. So this slide shows a similar comparison, except for the goes west. And you can see it's centered there over the East Pacific Ocean. And we have a very nice view of the Western US um, as well as uh, much of the Eastern Pacific. Alaska's there at the very top. And if you zoom in, we can actually see Alaska, especially Southern Alaska pretty well, despite the fact that it's fairly far North. And you can also see Hawaii there. If you look really carefully, um, the little islands are outlined um, by the map background. Um, now, we did have a problem with, or we do have a problem with the ABI on GO-17. It has some outages of infrared bands at certain times of day and certain times of night. And although it's still providing over 90% of the data it's designed to provide, it does have some outages in those infrared channels. And as a result, we are planning to replace GO-17 um, with GO-18 uh, next year or in early 2023. And again, I'll cover that more at the end. Next slide. Okay, so this graphic shows that we not we don't only have imaging and lightning mapping capabilities, we do have um, other capabilities as well. So the things mentioned on here, some of them are direct uh, results of, or I guess, products from the imager and the lightning mapper. Uh, things like tropical cyclone tracking, severe storm analysis, atmospheric winds. What that means is we can track the clouds, and uh, if you track a cloud with time, you can get an estimate of its vector or how fast it's moving in a certain direction. And then if you assign a height to that, that tells you an approximation of what the wind is doing, how strong is the wind at that level. That information is then fed into numerical models. Numerical models are the primary tool that forecasters use to forecast the weather. So if we get a better idea of what the winds are doing, um, then the forecast is necessarily going to be better. We also have space weather instruments on uh, GOES-16 and GOES-17. One of them is called SUVI, and that's an example image from SUVI in the top right. I'm going to show a movie of that a little bit later. That looks at the sun and tracks solar activity. And there are actually a, a several other space weather instruments uh, that, that track uh, things like the in, in situ conditions, things like high part, uh, energetic particles that are coming through space. And these are really important for certain applications. Wildfires, volcanic ash, and lightning are, are some additional applications. Next slide. Um, okay, so first, I, I I'm not going to get into too many details about uh, all of the different channels that we have on the imager or the ABI, but I do want to talk about uh, the very basic ones, which are visible and infrared. So visible imagery, what does that mean? Well, what we're looking at is sunlight from the sun coming down to the earth reflecting off of clouds or off the ground and back to the satellite. So you can think of it as what we can see with our naked eye or in the visible range of the electromagnet, electromagnetic spectrum. 
Um, we generally color just visible imagery by itself in black and white because with a single channel, you can't really de delineate colors from each other. This is a primary tool used by forecasters for monitoring clouds. Uh, the example that you're looking at here is actually one minute data um, over the Texas Panhandle. And uh, this, there's a really large storm there um, that I know is not resolving very well on the choppy uh, connection here. But that's, that's what a thunderstorm looks like from space. You, can, you should be able to see that it sort of has the, a bubbling nature, sort of like bubbling water on the top of the storm. Uh, forecasters use this information in addition to ground-based radar in order to do things like uh, issue warnings or even more commonly, I would say anticipate new storm formation. You can see the, the line of clouds extending from the southwest of that storm in the Texas Panhandle. These are cumulus clouds that may form into a storm, and this is really useful information for severe storms forecasters. Um, the spatial resolution of this particular channel is 500 meters. That means that we can't really see anything smaller than uh, on the scale of 500 meters on the Earth. Um, but still, that's a significant improvement over the previous generation of satellites. Next slide. The next major type of imagery that we get from the ABI is called infrared imagery. These are slightly longer wavelengths. And uh, what this does is allows us to see sort of the temperature of, of the various things on the Earth. So, for example, in, in this particular image, the infrared imagery is colored so that colder things start getting the colors from the blues into the greens into the yellows and the reds. You get colder, colder, colder. And so um, what that really means is we're detecting the tops of these cloud features at various points with, vertically within the atmosphere. And as you probably know, as you go up in the troposphere, it gets colder and colder and colder. So the red areas, those are the coldest tops or the strongest thunderstorms, generally speaking, uh, that you can see. And so the infrared imagery is mainly used for detecting clouds. And the big advantage over visible is it's available at night. We, we, can't, we don't have any visible imagery at night because the sun sets, no more sun to reflect off and, and detect that. So we have to use infrared imagery at that time. Here's an example. This was just... Uh, from 6 June of 2017, showing some thunderstorm activity over Florida. Um, and we use infrared imagery for lots of different applications. I just happened to show the example here of, uh, of thunderstorms. And the spatial resolution of, of this IR imagery is two kilometers. Next slide. Um, I want to talk about some different tools that we have in addition to those single channels, uh, one of which is a, is a product developed originally at CIRA called GeoColor. This is work by Dr. Steve Miller and his team at CIRA. What this does is it approximates true color or what we would our eyes would actually see from space during the daytime. Um, and, you know, the, the examples that I showed earlier of the visible imagery, that was black and white. Now we're going to bring in color. And what that allows us to do is easily differentiate between clouds and other things such as particles in the atmosphere, aerosols, that have a different color. So in this example, if you look really carefully, you can see, first of all, in western New Mexico, as the sun gets a little bit lower later in the day, there's some, uh, some gray plumes that look, it looks like smoke. Well, that's exactly what it is. It's smoke from wildfires that are burning in Arizona and New Mexico. So that's one big advantage of the true color imagery is you can easily differentiate the smoke from the clouds. Additionally, in this example, in Southeast Colorado, you can see what looks like a more sort of a brownish or a reddish color. That's actually blowing dust. And again, we're able to use the color of the dust, which looks exactly like we would expect it to look, a color that looks like dust in order to identify it and be able to track it. Uh, next slide. Now at night, we don't actually have the ability. Oh, sorry. I want to back up a little bit. So what I need, I need to explain a little bit. This is where I'm going to get into some more details if you're interested, is um, how do we make true color imagery from the ABI? Now you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So this particular chart shows the spectral channels of the ABI. They're highlighted there on the left column in green, and there are actually 16 total channels. But we, and we including in the blue portion of the spectrum and the red portion of the spectrum. In order to make true color imagery, you really need something in the red, the green, and the blue portion of the, of the spectrum. But we only have, we don't have green. So how are we going to come up with a way to make true color imagery despite the lack of a green channel? And again, this was a methodology developed by Dr. Steve Miller. Next slide. 
So step one is something called Rayleigh correction. So if you take a look at the, the first four channels on ABI, those are what images of them look like at the bottom with no corrections. The blue, green, and red um, by themselves look like they're, it's a little bit milky colored, especially on the blue end. That's due to what's something called Rayleigh scattering. Um, in order to make the true color imagery really uh, stand out and, you know, where you get really great contrast between the, the clear sky and the clouds, we really need to correct for that. And so the way you do that is something called Rayleigh correction. So now if you can toggle to the next part, you can watch how it goes from sort of the milky color, especially in the blue and the green, over to um, much more contrast between the clouds. And this is an important step to end up with a really crisp true color imagery. Next slide. Okay, so we, we actually, Dr. Miller started working on this way back when we had data only from the Himawari satellite. That's the Japanese geostationary satellite has a, an instrument called the Advanced Himawari Imager, quite similar to ABI, but not exactly the same. The main difference being they do have a green channel. They have a red, green, and a blue. And so we're able to make the true color imagery. So this is the what a true, a, a full disk image over the Western Pacific. You can see Australia there at the bottom. What this looks like with no correction and then if you toggle one time, you can see with the correction. And you, it really makes a tremendous difference in seeing that really sharp contrast between the blue ocean and, say, the red land or the deserts there of Australia. However, if you look really carefully, those with a sharp eye may notice something odd. Look at Southeast Asia. Look at New Guinea. Th these are places that are tr tropical in nature. And they really should be green. There's a lot of green vegetation there, but there is no green. So that's something that was noticed early on. And the next slide sort of explains why these things are not green like they should be. Um, so what we're looking at here are, is something called the spectral response functions of the ABI. This sort of shows what spectral ranges the bands one, two, and three cover. Um, and if you look at the green channel, it actually is a little bit offset to the shorter side of where the center of the green actually is. And that's why we're not getting the green that we should. However, channel four is, is centered at about 0.86 micrometers. This does pick up uh, reflectance of green things, such as over grasses. And so what Dr. Miller came up with was the idea of adding a component of that uh, channel four, which is at 0.86 microns, in order to bring out the green in the true color imagery. So next slide shows an example of that. So here is with no green correction. And then toggle one time and you can watch everything green up, especially there in New Guinea, Southeast Asia, and even the northern parts of Australia. So now if you compare this imagery to something from Veers, like I think Jarrell talked about last week, um, it should match up much better on, in terms of what the true color should look like. Next slide. So we still haven't solved the problem of why, how do we solve, how do we deal with the fact that the ABI does not have a green band? Well, the way that the, the team at CIRA decided to come up with that is they used the data that we collected from the Japanese satellite, the Himawari satellite, in order to build what's called a lookup table, because you, we have the red, the green, the blue, and the near IR, all of these four channels. And what we do is we take for every grid point over a large data set, we get the blue channel, the red channel, and the near IR channel. And then we write down what is the green component associated with that. And if you do this, it's sort of a three-dimensional lookup table. If you do this for a whole lot of different cases, you end up with a pretty robust lookup table. And that allows us for the ABI to then measure the blue, the red, the near IR, and then go to that lookup table to obtain the green component. And it really works surprisingly well uh, on how, how realistic looking the simulated true color is. So next slide will sh should show an animation. And this is something that you may be used to looking at if you've seen this types of imagery before. Um, during the daytime, this is the corrected, Rayleigh corrected version where we use the lookup table in order to build the true color. Now there's also a nighttime component. We can't do this at night because we don't have the reflect reflected bands. And so uh, there is an infrared product at night. It uses a static city lights background. You can see the lights on there. Those aren't actually changing. That's just something from the day-night band on Veers, which I expect um, Jarrell covered thoroughly last week. Um, and then high ice clouds are white and the lower liquid water clouds are blue in this particular scheme. And that allows us to get 24 hour imagery 
when this is looped over time. And so we don't sort of have a complete missing uh, product during the nighttime. If you want more details about this product called Geocolor, there is a paper. It, the reference is down there at the bottom. It was in uh, the Journal of Atmospheric and Oceanic Technology from uh, 2020. Next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to shift into showing some examples of the types of phenomena that we, we see and we track with geostationary satellite imagery. Um, the first, uh, uh, first type of examples are hurricanes. So you may remember Hurricane Michael back at made the land, made landfall uh, just east of Panama City, Florida, in the Panhandle of Florida, back in October of uh, 2018. Um, we, you can see in this example, this is visible imagery just by itself, 500 meter resolution, tracking the storm at every one minute. And it's very easy to pick out the eye of the storm. Obviously, it looks exactly like what we'd expect it to see. And uh, we were able to track that storm as it came and made landfall and did some, it was extremely destructive, of course, uh, for those areas that, uh, that it affected in, uh, in Florida. Next slide. Um, here's another way to look at imagery. This is something called what we call the sandwich product, where we sandwich together visible and infrared imagery at the same time. Um, and in this case, we're looking at Hurricane Dorian. This is uh, the island there that you're looking at, I believe is called Great Abaco. It's part of the Northeastern Bahama Islands. This was back on the 1st of September, 2015. And this was actually, I believe, a Category 5 storm when it made landfall and did uh, just ho horrible damage there in, uh, in the Bahamas. But um, the, the primary tool for tracking these hurricanes when they're out over the ocean is GO-16 in this part of the ocean. Next slide. Here's yet another visible example. Uh, this was Hurricane Ida just a couple months ago, back at the end of August, making landfall in Louisiana. Um, if you look really carefully in this loop, you can see these little, uh, what are called mesovortices spinning within the eye. Uh, you can think of these as sort of little spin-ups happening um, in the low cloud field. And it's possible that uh, there are actually wind gusts that are enhanced due to these little spin-ups. They're, the size of these things is on the order of, you know, a, a much larger than something like a tornado and also not as strong as a tornado, but it's on the order of, say, a few kilometers in, in, uh, in horizontal scale. And we do often see these mesovortices with extremely strong tropical cyclones, especially when we can see down into the eye, like in this case with Ida. Next slide. Okay, I want to, oops, let's go yeah, this example here. So this is a, uh, the first example I've shown of the Geostationary Lightning Mapper, or GLM. And in this particular example, the GLM data is plotted on top of the ABI data, the Geocolor product. And it shows up as the sort of the purple and the white flashes that occur with the clouds. Um, and so GLM data, is, again, this is a brand new thing. It's not something that we had before. This example is from October 10th of 2021. And it really provides um, excellent situational awareness for forecasters to say where is the lightning occurring and to be able to track it with time and also to help out with uh, things like so for example let's say that there was a, a high school football game occurring on this particular night in uh, in south texas this is one where uh, forecasters may look at the glm data and be able to anticipate oh we, we see some lightning coming in or this cloud nearby has lightning that's extending over a fairly large area and in that situation, they be, may be able to warn the event and say, you know, this is the this is dangerous. Let's clear the stands and let, let's in order to keep people safe from lightning activity. So in this exci exciting new technology there with uh, Go 16 and 17. Next slide. Uh, here's another example. This is something called a derecho. You may remember this from uh, August of 2010. This was a multiple state uh, straight line windstorm that occurred uh, over Iowa, Illinois, and into Indiana and other areas. Um, and the lightning activity is plotted on top of the ABI imagery. And you can see sort of a leading line or the, a, a squall line with lots of lightning. And then behind that is what we call the stratiform portion of the mesoscale convective system. And you can see some intermittent flashes occurring there as well. This storm produced uh, massive damage to uh, buildings and crops. The, the, the photo shown here is example of some of the crop damage that occurred in the wake of the derecho. Next slide. Uh, here is one example of one of our space weather instruments called SUVI. We're looking at the ultraviolet portion of the spectrum. This was the sun, uh, a, a major solar flare that occurred back on 10 September 2017. 
Uh, we've actually seen some increasing activity in the sun here recently. Um, you probably heard some news about the aurora activity picking up a, a few weeks ago, and that was due to um, some solar activity, which this is the type of thing that this instrument is designed to do, is detect these solar flares. And that allows us, this in coronal mass ejections, allows us to uh, anticipate ahead of time uh, that some of this um, activity may be disruptive, actually, for things like communications on the Earth. Next slide. Okay, wildfires. This is one uh, application that I haven't really talked about yet, but this is, I would say, of all of the things with GO 16 and 17, we were most surprised about. Uh, fire detection was probably number one, is really the incredible ability that this instrument is able to detect the hotspots from fires. The resolution of the fire detection band is a factor of four better from the previous satellite, which means we can see fires that are four times smaller than we could uh, previously. So uh, the, the visualization that we're looking at here takes the infrared detection of the hotspots. Those are those red uh, dots there. And then it takes the, the, the visible imagery, the geocolor, and puts it on top of it. So you can see both the hotspots and the smoke. And this was an extreme example of uh, uh, tons of wildfires last year along the West Coast. It actually looks like in this imagery that we're seeing the flames, the red. We're not actually seeing the flames. This is just the sort of the visualization technique of the hotspots being colored the red pixels. Um, so dramatic impacts there from these massive wildfires out west, really the last several summers, uh, this summer included. Next slide. Uh, here's another fire example. This was from Montana in the fall of, uh, of 2017, really end of summer. I think this was the uh, September 4th, 3rd and 4th. Uh, they had a really dry summer there in the summer of 2017 in western Montana and Idaho and they had uh, some of these massive wildfires breaking out. And again, we're looking at the hot spots in the red and yellow and the smoke is, is the, um, you can see that clearly, but you can also see something called pyrocumulonimbus, which is actually clouds forming over the tops of the hot spots. And those are uh, streaming off to the east along with the smoke. Next slide. Here's another example. This is a black and white image so we can get the better resolution of the Creek fire um, back in uh, 2020 over California. And um, what really shows up here is another one of these pyrocumulonimbus, or you get the white cloud material forming over the top of the smoke. What's happening is the hot spot is sort of helping pulse the convection up. And then if you get enough convection in this type of environment, sometimes you'll get clouds to form. And so the wider pixels, uh, the ones that are sort of reflecting more sunlight is more traditional cloud material compared to the smoke which doesn't reflect quite as much due to its darker color. Next slide. Let's skip this one and move on. OK, uh, another application, volcanic eruptions. Uh, so I I'm cheating a little bit here. This is not actually a GO-16 or GO-17 example. This, again, is a Himawari 8 example over the northwestern Pacific. But we do have similar capabilities with GOES East and West. This is the eruption of the Raikoki volcano south, southwest of Kamchatka. And uh, volcanic ash shows, again, in the true color imagery, what we would expect it to show up as this brown color. Shows up really well against the cloud background. Next slide. We can also detect volcanic ash with um, some infrared channels and something called an RGB which is an RGB is sort of a unique combination of channels that you can put together to bring out certain features. This particular RGB is known as the ash RGB. And again, we're looking at the Northwest Pacific, the Southern coast of the Kamchatka Peninsula. And you can see a volcano erupting there. And that sort of greenish plume moving off to the South is the volcanic ash. Um, the volcanic ash is extremely dangerous for airplanes. You don't want to fly an airplane into an ash cloud because it actually can cause a failure of the engine. Now, if you look really, really carefully you, in this loop, you can see these lines of what look like clouds, linear features. These are actually aircraft contrails. This is a very common route for aircraft to take when they fly from, say, North America over to East Asia. And we're able to detect the contrails from those. In the middle of this loop, some of those contrails actually start to have a little kink in them. They, and what's happening is the planes are getting word of this volcanic eruption, and they're deviating their flight path in order to avoid the ash cloud. I, I just thought this was a really neat example because it includes both the ash from the volcano as well as uh, the contrails. Next slide. 
Okay, a little bit more on supercells. Uh, these are supercells are rotating thunderstorms. And with the really high resolution imagery that we have, we can actually sometimes detect as we're looking sort of at the side of the cloud from an angle, the rotation within the cloud itself. Now, radar is certainly the primary tool for detecting, uh, say, storm scale rotation within a storm. But the satellite data, this is not something we anticipated being able to do with GOES 16 and 17. Is In certain cases, if the anvil of the cloud has blown off to the north and you're, you can see the side of the cloud, you can actually detect the rotation there of the cloud. Next slide. Um, here is another example of some of these rotating storms. Uh, the yellow area, yellow arrows indicate um, early on in the loop, at least. And, and again, this is probably not going to show up super well uh, on the shared screen. But it, and when you can look at this imagery, which happens to be actually six second imagery, it's something that we did as a special test during the GOES-S checkout. Um, you can clearly see the, the sides of these clouds rotating as in the previous case. Next slide. Okay, here is an example of a supercell using what we call this IR sandwich imagery. I mentioned the sandwich imagery earlier when we were looking at Hurricane Dorian. This example is of a supercell thunderstorm over the Lubbock, Texas area. We take visible imagery and then we take infrared imagery that's color enhanced, make it partially transparent and lay them on top of each other. And that way you can see the shadows from the visible imagery and then the colors from the infrared give you an idea of how deep the clouds are. In this particular case, we see something called an, um, an above anvil cirrus plume. If you don't know what that is, you can Google it and you'll find some, some great papers uh, about that by uh, folks like Chris Bedka. And uh, this is an indication of a very strong storm and, and nearly all supercells that we see that are producing severe storms, they do have these um, above anvil cirrus plumes, which are detectable from GOES 16 and 17. Next slide. Okay, I want to say a little bit about level two products. So what much of what I've talked about today has been uh, what we call imagery, or you're just sort of plotting the, the data itself from the satellite and putting, a, say, a color enhancement on it and looking at that. And you can learn a lot from that. But there has been a lot of work done to produce what are called level two products. And this is a long list of them here. You can see things like aerosol detection, cloud detection, um, uh, sea and lake ice, snow cover, total precipitable water, et cetera, et cetera. There's a very long list of level two products and uh, we have that data available as well. I didn't get into it today, mainly due to the, the lack of time, but you can uh, go to the website there that goes our website, a list to get more details on the products. And you, if, you need to, if you'd like to use this data for say part of your, some of your research or maybe a product that you're working on, uh, you can download it and, and use it for free. Next slide. Okay, so I teased at the beginning goes T. Well, we do have the third launch in the GOES-R series coming up in early 2022. GOES-T is going to be launched from Kennedy Space Center in early 2022. Um, again, once it reaches geo orbit, it will become GOES-18. And after checkout, we're going to move it over to the west position in order to replace GOES-17. Um, and looking even further down the road, GOES-U, which is the fourth and final in the GOES-R series, um, is planned for launch in 2024. Next slide. And then I wanted to also say a few more words about GeoXO. So GeoXO is, stands for Geostationary Extended Observations, and this is NOAA's future geostationary satellite program. And the plan is for it to operate from the early 2030s all the way out to the 2050s. We are making some changes uh, compared to the current uh, series of satellites with GOES-R. Um, they're all improvements. Um, what, so the, the little picture here shows what we're doing. In addition to an east and west spacecraft, we're going to add a third spacecraft in the center, and that spacecraft will carry um, a new instrument called a hyperspectral infrared sounder. It will carry an, a new instrument called atmospheric composition. And there's even room for a third instrument, which we haven't yet uh, determined what that'll be. And then on the GOES East and West spacecraft, in addition to the imager and the lightning mapper like we have now, we're going to add ocean color capability. So this is a, a really a big step up in technology and it allows us to expand our program really from more than just this earth observation of weather systems out to things like climate and oceans. So we're really excited about GeoXO um, coming in the 20, 2030s. It'll be here before you know it. Next slide. So just wrapping up, I'm going to leave you here with some links. If you're interested in catching up with us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, et cetera, you can go to those uh, 
particular feeds. I especially recommend the NOAA satellites feeds. Um, they provide some really amazing and useful information from all of uh, NESDA's satellites. So I'll stop there and take any questions that anybody may have. Thank you so much, Dan. That was a that was a wonderful presentation. It's always a treat to um, see your presentations. You always show such such wonderful um, imagery, and you're always showing new things as well, uh, which is which is really refreshing. Thank you so much. We um, we did receive uh, actually a question, so I want to remind everybody who's who's watching us right now. There's a window uh, down there in the bottom for Q and A. Uh, any questions you might have, please submit them right now. Type them in, and and we'll read them out to Dan. Um, we did in anticipation of this presentation. We received a question via social media, Dan, and um, I like this question. It asks if goes 18 will be replacing goes 17 in the goes west position. What will happen with goes 17? Will it be used for something else, placed in standby? or sent to the graveyard orbit? Is after goes 18, um, is checked out in the west position and becomes operational, is we're gonna move goes 17, which is currently in the west, over to the center of the US in the checkout location, or sorry, in the storage location rather, of 105 degrees west longitude. That's over roughly the Colorado longitude and it will become our standby at that point or the on-orbit spare. And the idea there is if there is a pro any problem at all with GOES-16 or GOES-18 after that time, then GOES-17 is available for emergency operations and it can be turned on and sort of used as the backup. That's a great answer. Thank you, Dan. And, and actually, while I'm checking here the emails, somebody on, on the line uh, uh, who's joining us actually asked that question as well. So I think that was a satisfactory answer also for Margaret Mooney is actually who's asking that. Um, let's see, I have here a question from um, Sahil. He asks, does NOAA provide raw data coming from satellites in RF before decoding? We consider raw data as what we call level zero data that comes down from the satellite. And we do have that data available on the class website, CLASS. If you can actually just go and do a search for NOAA class, and that, that's basically our archive. So if you're interested in working with the level zero data, the raw data, you can go and, and obtain that. Now, if you want to talk about slightly more processed data, where you're actually getting radiances that are calibrated and navigated, that's known as level 1B data. And that's something that's, I guess, more readily available in real time. Um, both level zero and level one B are both available via class though, if you wanna download that data and work with it. That's great then, thank you. Another question here from Jan. Could you please talk a little bit about the instrument difficulty that Go17 had after its launch? Sure, yeah. So what happened was um, the cooling system on the GOES-17 ABI, the, the loop heat pipe part of that, which is the part that takes the heat from the instrument, it gets heated up a lot during the night, especially from the sun and from the internal workings, takes that heat and then it moves it over to the radiator where it radiate, radiates it out to space. There was a problem with the filters on the loop heat pipes preventing the, that circulation from occurring properly. And so um, what we're doing with goes, the GOES-18 ABI is we have redesigned the, the loop heat pipe system. We've gotten rid of the filters and you know, basically made it so that we will not have this problem happen again. And so that's, that is a change to the GOES-18 and GOES-19, the GOES-U ABI systems, so that we won't have the same issue happening again. Thank you, Dan. Another question that we have here Keith is asking, hi, very informative, thank you. If I may ask, what is the spatial resolution for fire detection slash pixels? Uh, another great question. So um, the primary fire detection band on the ABI is centered at 3.9 micrometers. And the, the spatial resolution of that channel at the sub point means directly below the satellite is, is two kilometers. 
So that means the pixel is two kilometers by two kilometers. Now, one, one really interesting thing though, as an addition to this, is we can actually see really hot fires with shorter wavelength bands as well, including the 1.6 micrometer band, which is one that was not designed for fire detection. But if you have a really, really hot fire, you can detect it with 1.6. And the 1.6 resolution is actually one kilometer. So in certain cases, you can get one kilometer fire detection. But for the most part, for most fires, um, ones that are especially new and not very hot, it's the 3.9 band and it has two kilometer resolution. And just to uh, extend a little bit on that question, Dan, and I've asked you this before, how big must the fire be for it to be detected by the GO satellite in that band? So uh, the detect the whether or not we can detect it actually depends on a number of factors. So something that's really, really hot, if it's, it, it can be smaller and we're still able to detect it. Um, and, and really it, it depends on some other things as well that I won't get into, but um, the bottom line is, I would say, oh, sorry, another important thing, it also depends on the background. So like if a fire happens to be burning in a, in a really cold environment and all of the surrounding pixels are really cold, that means we'll be able to pick it up due to the contrast, say when it's not very hot at all. So it really depends on all of those things. But if you want to get an idea, um, we did see an example of one of our weather service for National Weather Service forecast partners told us that uh, one time they were, I think it was over Kentucky, the forecaster was monitoring the imagery. He saw a hot spot in the 3.9 band, called up the local emergency manager to tell him and said, it looks like we have a hot spot at this latitude and this longitude. You might want to check it out. And so they did. They went out there. It turns out it was a barn on fire. So that's an example of a you know fairly small feature, something on the size on the order of a barn uh, that we're able to detect with uh, with goes. Now it, I think we could probably see things even smaller than a barn if it was really really hot, and in some cases that probably is the case. That was great. That was a great answer and a great example. And the main point driving that it, it's not that the whole pixel uh, right, it's not that the whole right. area is burning. It just needs to set off that pixel by by it being intense enough. Yep. Uh, another question that we have here, if GOES 17 is still mostly functional while it has been moved to storage at 105 degrees west, why not use it to collect data from that location? Yeah, good question. So um, the, the reason primarily, primarily has to do with uh, limitations in our ground processing and our operational uh, group is we can't really easily um, have three different satellites being operated at the same time. It puts a strain on our computing resources and on our operators. I mean, there's actually people working, you know, 24 seven in, uh, in Maryland who are operating these satellites. And so we can, we will sometimes do three satellites just during the checkout phase of Ghost T. But in terms of, I guess, real time operations, we really have a limit of only two operational satellites in Ghost East and West. Thank you. That was, that was perfect. Another question that I have here from the audience, this one comes from, from Hartle. What will happen with GOES-16 when GOES-U becomes operational GOES-East? So the short answer is we don't know yet. Uh, there, there are a number of different things we've done with, with old satellites from, uh, from the previous series. In some cases, we will actually loan them out to say other parts of, of the US government or maybe even other governments such as Brazil. Uh, things like that have been done before and it, they might be done again. Now, um, when the satellites are completely not usable anymore, when they say run out of fuel and there's really no, not possible to provide any value anymore, what we do is we move them into something called a graveyard orbit. Uh, and so we, we increase the altitude of the satellite so that it's up away from anything else. And these geostationary satellites are so far away, they're away from most of the other space junk. The majority of the space junk is much closer to the Earth than these. And so they're really not any danger at all at such these extremely high altitudes up there. Very good. Thank you. Another question, this time from Patrick. Thanks for the great overview. Is there a plan in place to determine what a partner payload would be and where it would come from for the Geo Central bus? I guess this is in reference to GeoXO, obviously. Yeah, that that's a um, another good question because I did mention the partner payload. Just 
don't know yet. Uh, we're going to be working on that over the next few years of determining, you know, what would be a suitable partner. And um, we don't know even where it'll come from. So I, I would say check back, um, I don't know, every year or so as the program becomes more mature and hopefully we'll, we'll have an answer for that question. Thank you. There's a question here from Carl. It's a bit long. In ground stations, have you seen LTE wireless signals within the AWS-3 range, 1695, 1710 megahertz, cause GOES reception loss occur? And what can be done to mitigate this? So I'm not going to pretend to be able to, um, to know the answer to this because I don't. <laughs> So, um, Carl, what I would suggest, if you could maybe send that question in an email to me, I will find an answer for you because um, there are lots of experts on things like this throughout throughout our group, and I'm certain that I could get the answer for you. So, apologies, I don't know the answer to that one. Thank you, Dan. That's okay. And yeah, just to remind everybody, contact information is available there on the screen in case you need to reach it. And we will be, you know, uh, making this uh, recording available online as well as the slides. In uh, th there's a link down there in the bottom left corner that says web links, and this is future Ned Talks. Uh, so you can always go there to also get that information. We do have a couple more questions here, Dan. Will the ground stations and processing systems be improved for GeoXO? This comes from um, Sarah. So I, the short answer is they're going to have to be improved to some degree because we're going to be um, we're going to be providing a lots more data, total data coming in and different data. So uh, the, the answer is yes. We don't have the details of any of that yet. Uh, right now we're working on sort of the um, the flight side of determining the instruments and the satellites themselves. And then, you know, we have something like 10 years between until the first launch, we will be working on the ground processing. And so the answer is almost certainly yes, it will be improved, but we don't yet know the details. Very good. Thank you. Just reminding everybody, you still have a chance to ask Dan a question. I'm going to I'm gonna throw you a quick question, Dan. Perhaps you don't have the answer for this, but, you know, Carl was referring to the interference uh, in, in the uh, communication bands with the satellite. But I have also read that there may be um, interference from 5G in, uh, in the optical side of things, in, in uh, the spectrum where we're looking at the um, uh, water vapor, I believe. Uh, could, do you know anything about this? Could you let us know? Um, yeah, I, I don't know much about it, but I, I know a little, and that is, I believe that the 5G frequencies that are of a concern are um, in what, what we call the microwave wavelengths, and, and which are used um, mainly on the polar orbiting satellite side in order to uh, get information about water vapor. And um, we don't have the ability at this time to detect microwave uh, wavelengths with geo orbit. Um, we do have some some satellites, though, on the low Earth orbit side, on the LEO side, that are able that are actually designed specifically for detecting microwave wavelengths, and it is something that is a concern for that. And there's a you know there's lots of groups that are looking very closely at this for the future. Wonderful answer. Thank you so much. We did get um, another uh, question here. Um, it has to do with the launch, Dan. Will the public be invited for GOES T like they did with S? I went to S launch at KSC. He's bragging now. This person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I believe, I, I guess I can't answer this definitively because a lot of it is going to depend on um, Kennedy Space Center themselves. You know, they have, they're the ones that get to decide, you know, is it safe? To, to invite a large group to uh, to come down for the launches. You know, COVID-19 is still a big deal, of course, and everybody is being very careful about that. So that is kind of the X factor in the launch operations. Um, I believe the answer is probably yes to the public question, but I can't answer that definitively. I would recommend, um, you know, contacting maybe Kennedy Space Center themselves to find out uh, the details about that. Great answer, Dan. Thank you. Well, I believe that's all the questions that we've got today. So this was great. Um, Dan, it's always such a pleasure to hear your presentations and to hear the answers to the questions that you provide. Thank you so much. 
Thanks so much, Rafa, for having me. And really, thanks to everybody who took the time to uh, to listen over the last hour or so. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that's great. And everybody, remember, next week, we're going to have Dan back again, actually. And we're going to have Jorel Torres back again as well. And we're going to have them sitting with a couple of end users. So we're going to be talking about Polar and Geo, NOAA satellites. In a, It's not going to be a presentation. We're going to have a panel where we're going to be asking them to talk about how both orbits complement each other and you know why it's necessary to have both these orbits to observe the Earth. So with that, I'll let everybody go. And thank you so much again, Dan. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today.